Hello and welcome back to Verbal Money. This podcast is not afraid to deal with the big questions, just like what was more one-sided, Pimlet versus Helwani or Sabatello's performance in the eyes of one judge. Um, I think we've made it pretty far without having to talk about judging as a big part of this podcast, but that will definitely change today. Um, we don't have Jamie with us today. Um, unfortunately, he only does paid podcast performances now. Um, so we don't have the budget, but hopefully we'll have him back soon. Uh, we do have Steve back from now that now that places have started to open up betting lines again. We got you back. Uh, yeah, so- all, my, all the allegations are cleared. Um, no ties to James Krause here. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, no ties to James Krause. So we're all good. <laughs> we're all good and jake's here as well jake all in the all clear mate for now no, oh well just <laughs> just you wait and see fellas <laughs> <laughs> all right um we'll start with bellator because it was the the first event of the weekend um and i i feel like the most obvious thing to say from the off is that uh we hyped this show up a decent amount uh last week um i think i know the answer to this but did it deliver for you guys? Um, not especially, nah. Um, I thought the main event was a bit better than a lot of people seem to. Um, I thought st- when it was on the feet, when Stott was pushing forward, the fight itself was fine. But um, that's what you're going to get with a Danny Sabatello fight when he's on top. He he is, for lack of a better term, boring. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, there were some good upsets on the prelims, though. There were some good finishes. Um, obviously, Pat Downey lost in the first round. Um, Cody Law lost as well. Um, Keel Holtz lost. So, yeah. It was an interesting card. And, of course, Patty Mix, great performance against Magomedov. Yeah. yeah that was I the was, other big one. Right? Yeah, I was going to say that the Coleman event really did it for me because uh, Magomedov, you know, he was kind of revered as this guy who was going to clear out uh, Bellator's bantamweight division, and now you have a, a guy like Patchy Mix who's been around for a while, like actually just getting the recognition he deserves. Like he's he's been regarded as an elite guy um, for the last couple of years at least. But I feel like a win like this, uh, it's it's going to be monumental. And I'm actually looking forward to the finals now between uh, Stotts and Mix. Yeah, I yeah. think that that ended up about as perfect as it could have been with that with those two in the final. I feel like. Um, that's going to be a great fight, and I think I'd favor Mix at this point, to be honest. Hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 it's good that sometimes with these tournaments, when they when they play out how you don't expect them, and you end up getting a, a final that doesn't really feel worthy, you know what I mean? But it, um, it works out perfectly for them too with the featherweights as well, of course, with Pitbull and AJ in the final. Yeah. Yeah, so it's worked out quite well for them. There wasn't a, a, a whole lot else, like you said, Steve, apart from some of the upsets earlier on in the night. Um, but yeah. Patch and Mix's performance, that, I thought yeah. was great. Of course, was a flyweight title fight. Um, Liz Camouche, a bit clearer this time than the first time with the submission. Um, yeah, it's a good win for her. Yeah, and we got the first uh, the first hint that maybe uh, some controversy was going to happen this weekend with that Danny Sabatello scorecard. Um, just bizarre. I, I don't know how you could score that fight. Yeah. Um, so dominantly for Danny Sabatello, I really don't. I, I can usually try and justify um, things and kind of, you know, play devil's advocate on things like this, try and see where they're coming from, maybe. But I, I, I don't know about that one, guys. <laughs> and then you see him score the fight that way, and then you think, I know, let's fly him out to Las Vegas. Yeah. Oh my god. Of course. When you see a scorecard like that, the commission should step in and think, you know, maybe we should not. Not, I'm not saying take him off the car, just like don't have him in the co main event, you know. Commission should be looking at things like that. Um, Luke Thomas had a great rant on the Nevada Commission, which I would urge you all to watch on his post fight show. Yeah, yeah, uh, like I said, start of kind of some strange things and and just weird that two of them uh revolved around Doug Crosby, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, because UFC 282 happened on saturday night um a card that we kind of said the main event maybe didn't get us that excited but a lot of a lot of great fights on the rest of the card um and for the most point they all lived up i think like so many great finishes of course um and then the co-main and main event felt like a separate event 
Um, so I, I feel like maybe we should just split the two up. We'll talk about the co-main and the main event first, and then we'll get into the actual good stuff that happened all over the card. Um, how do you guys feel about Jan Blachowicz versus Magomed Ankalaev? Obviously, I did in a draw, so the light heavyweight division is still in a very weird place. We've already had it announced that they're just going to do a different <laughs> vacant heavyweight, uh, light heavyweight fight instead because Dana hated the fight so much. Um, I didn't think it was that bad of a fight, to be honest. I didn't expect it to get slated by Dana that heavily. Um, of course, weird result, and it leaves the division in a weird place, but I, it felt odd. But I don't think the fight itself was necessarily to blame for that. I was gonna let you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. Go on. I was, go gonna, on. I was gonna let you go, Jake. Um I suppose yeah, I didn't think it was that bad of a fight at all. Honestly, I, I don't know where Dane is coming from. I mean, he's left in a very weird position as a promoter because he's now had to put the vacant title back on the line a month later with two different fighters. Um so I can understand maybe his frustration in that regard, but I thought it was a you know it's better than most light heavyweight title fights are. Honestly, like <laughs> First round was competitive enough, and I think that's kind of the the round that a lot of people differ in. Uh, rounds two and three, Blahovich looked very impressive with uh, with his kicks, uh, and rounds four and five, um, particularly round five, potentially a ten eight for Ankalaev. A lot of uh, a lot of dominance on the ground. So, yeah, not the most exciting fight in the world, but like I don't think uh, it's not deserving of a of a Dana White, you know, clippable moment where he's saying the fight was you know pure art or anything like that. So. Um, how did you actually have the fight? I had a 46 tank alive. Yeah, I'd agree. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like everyone, everyone was. I haven't seen anyone say that that Jan uh, did enough to to win the fight or get a draw. I've only seen whether you gave three to two to Ankalaev or whether you gave him a 10-8. That seems to be the only talking point. Um, so I can understand why Ankalaev was uh, upset. I thought Jan's reaction was absolutely incredible um, to say that that Magomed should have won the fight. Um, and then since then, Jan's kind of posted a, a thing on social media where he was saying about how one guy was complaining about injuries whilst the other guy was, you know, being humble and stuff. So a little bit weird after. Um, but the, the, the light heavyweight title picture right now is such a mess. Like, it always feels like when you get a, a vacant title fight that this kind of thing could happen yeah. and so with it actually happening and then like you say we've got Glover Teixeira versus Jamahal Hill which I, I don't even know what to think about that it's just I guess like it's such an odd matchup though right? because like the lower half of like heavyweight with all the like young exciting fighters have been kept away from the top older yeah. kind of slower end of the division for so long and the only guy to really break through was Yuri Prohashka. I know um I suppose uh, Ankalaev as well. Um into that title picture status, but now Jamal Hill is gonna like look, that's just such a random fight. Honestly, it is. Um and like not to kind of knock the matchup, but like Jamal Hill's win streak has not been against the best opposition, and Glover Teixeira is a former champion coming off a loss with no title defenses. You say yes, that, that you say that. Um, I think by the end of January that Jamal Hill is going to be the UFC light heavyweight champion. Oof. Hot take, hot take. I just think his power is going to be a lot for Glover. If Glover gets it to the ground, it's game over in that regard. But I think if Jamal, Jamal, he's shown his power a couple of times now. Um, I think if he catches Glover, it could be dangerous. Man, very, very, we, very, um... very powerful strike. Yeah, I don't know. We spoke about um a few days ago um in, in our group about doing a, a an episode where we try and predict the champions of every weight division by the end of 2023. I light heavyweight is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how we do that one. I like because we don't. Full we can lose the mirror. I'm saying it now. <laughs> All great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna be so difficult. Um Mal Hill wins the title, gives Paul Craig a rematch. There we go. <laughs> That'd be incredible. Yeah. Uh um co-main event. Um 
I don't even know what to say about the week that Paddy Pimlet has had, to be honest. Um, there are a lot of people that... He's, he's a very Marmite character anyway, whether you love him or hate him. And I feel like that line has shifted quite a bit this week. Um, away from all of the stuff with Ariel Hawani uh, and stuff in the media. The, the fight itself did not do him any favours either. No favours at all. Obviously, he won the unanimous decision. Um very controversially, a lot of people had Jared Gordon winning at least two of the rounds. Um, what did you guys make of it when the when the results were uh, were called out? Again, got a feeling I know which way you're going to go on this. I mean, I expected it. I expected them to. I mean, I, I'm, I'm. But in saying that, I'm not saying I picked Paddy Pimlet. By the way, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I clearly not, picked I, Jared Gordon to win, but I yeah, thought, yeah, Jared should win, but Paddy's going to win. It just had that feeling. Yeah, no, I, 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 like, I was expecting Paddy to get the decision as a prediction, um, but like, also in the sense of like, they're not going to give him this decision, are they? Like, he's like, I gave, I like, I had a twenty nine, twenty eight to Gordon. I thought he won the first two rounds pretty handily, and I gave the third round to Paddy because he like he actually threw something in the third round. Yeah. Um, as opposed to Gordon, that fight, and like no matter what we cut it, Paddy Pimlet did not win that fight. Um, but you could just tell, you could just tell. Who's mm. gonna get that decision? And like the video of Dana standing beside, um, what's his face on we gone? That's actually that's actually grown man. But, um. Like Dana's reaction, he's just so relieved, and you can just tell that he knows that the check has not bounced to the judges. You know what I mean? Like I, I actually, I texted, I texted into the into the, the group chat at like half five in the morning, being like, "Yeah, the brown paper envelope was handed to the judges just now, so I expect Paddy by decision." I, shocking, shocking judging. Yeah, uh, I don't really know what else there is. That we can talk about with this fight, like uh, uh, we could, we could probably go into the performances themselves. But I don't think Paddy was that great, and uh, Jared Gordon did enough to win, but he, he wasn't, you know, he didn't look exceptional either. So I don't really know if there's anything else to go into regarding the fight. Like it is always just going to be known as the one that Paddy shouldn't have won. Um, but you know, the win streak keeps on going, so tougher opponents are on the way, I suppose. So um, where do you, where do you go with Paddy next? Do you think? Because um, like, Gaethje they could for for some retribution. Because <laughs> yeah. um, in theory they could be like, well, people know he he lost, so that's an excuse to not give him a harder opponent in the next fight. But at the same time, they could think top fifteen, he's not far away so it's an interesting one especially if he's going to be on that 2a6 card um depending depending on his injury of course but if they put him on that card you'd think they'd want to give him someone at least with a name maybe not a top guy but someone with a name which is why i think that terence mckinney matchup it could be the time for that yeah i agree with you i think i don't i don't I don't, I don't think it's a good matchup for paddy but i think that could be the direction they go in I don't yeah. think they're going to do that. I think they realize how dangerous McKinney is. Honestly, um, they're probably going to feed him an older guy. Like if... I'd like to look at Michael Johnson. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, Michael Johnson has enough of a name, and it actually presents a dangerous fight to Paddy. Like if Jared Gordon could light him up with a left hook like that, God only knows what Michael Jordan or Michael Johnson could do to him. So <laughs> that'd be an interesting I mean, fight. Michael, Michael Jordan, could, Michael Jordan could probably run laps around him as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, Michael Johnson, I I like to look at that fight. No, it's like, by the way, we saw Paddy in that first round. Anyone with anything close to knockout power is going to get him out of there, you would think, unless Paddy really shows up that defense, which he's shown zero evidence of so far. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with everything you guys just said. Um, Rest of the card, however, um, was great. Like a really, really good event. Every guy who got a finish got a bonus. Um, I don't even know where to start because there were so many good ones. Um, like the main card alone, all three fights delivered so highly. Um, even 
I thought that maybe the the Ponzinibbio versus Morono fight maybe wasn't going to. It was a great performance by Alex Morono, but I thought that fight was going to be a banger. And then Ponzinibbio turned it around in the third round. I was like, we're on for a winner. This this these the next two fights coming up are going to deliver, and we're going to be talking about one of the pay per views of the year. Um, because up until that point, it was just highlight finishes um, all over the place. Mm-hmm. What uh, what finish were you guys most impressed by? Do you guys want to talk about Paul first, or? Yeah, so I was gonna say our lad Paul. Oh boy, he he fucking smashed Jay Perrin. Like, um, I was gonna say like we all predicted, but we didn't. We didn't really know how he was gonna fare. Like, we predicted he was gonna beat. We didn't even get his first name right, Jake. Let alone making a prediction. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair enough. That's fair enough. But um, no, like he actually looks pretty impressive for a kid of eighteen. He is. He's very talented. And like, yeah, the opposition wasn't the best. And you know, let's hope they don't Sage North cut him by accident and accidentally give him someone who's a little too good. Um, so yeah, very impressive. And the fans seem to like him as well. He got a really big reception. Um and like the, the clips of him online have gone a little bit viral, like the one where he's asking, you know, <laughs> can he get the uh, the bonus because he wants to buy a, a minivan for his mother to drive him to the PI. Yeah, that like that is he's really need to lean into the whole. Oh, look at me! I'm working super, super talented guy, though. Yeah, very impressive. I thought. Yeah. Um, I mean, it that got followed. Obviously, there was the break between the prelims and the main card, but I think that got followed by the performance of the night, in my opinion, Elia Tapuria against Bryce Mitchell. Yeah. Um, a fight that we all thought was going to be close. Um, on paper, but. In reality, Elia Tapuria is a scary individual. Yeah, it's, you say you say we all thought about this close. Obviously, I wasn't on the podcast this or last week. Um, this went about how I expected, to be honest. Um, <laughs> people obviously, Ilya, yeah, he's so crazy to watch in the sense that he just keeps coming forward and he puts everything into every punch. So I thought that would cause Bryce problems on the feet, as well as that. Before this fight, he had never been taken down in the UFC. So that that was huge. Um, and I think Bryce only got him down once, I think. So, you know, he's still very, very good in that regard as well against a guy like Bryce. But no, I figured Ilya's power would cause Bryce a lot of problems. And that's pretty much how this went. Yeah, um, obviously, Ilya is a very, very good striker, but... Um... I feel like I've seen better striking from Bryce Mitchell in the past, but he really, mm. the, the power difference was crazy yeah. to watch. And like you said, like you said, Steve, there was the bit at the end of the first round where Tapuria threw a shot and missed and he fell over himself because he threw it <laughs> so hard. <laughs> I yeah. was like, oh, if that lands, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. It was pretty, pretty ridiculous to watch. Yeah. Um, following that up, we had Darren Till against Strikers to Plessy. Um, a strange, strange fight to watch. Very weird fight. Where the first round was uh, an absolute domination from Drikus, but one that I can't remember ever watching before, where a fighter was like pinned, pinned. stood up. Like it, it felt weird. Um, it, you know, it didn't look good. Uh, after that first round, and then I thought Darren Till had a great second round. Um, that the big kind of uh, negatives against Darren in his recent fights of him being not throwing it enough. I, you know, not that he was throwing like Max Holloway or anything, but the output was was increased. And then Strikers takes him down again and gets the third round submission. Um, I don't like making excuses for Darren Till because we shouldn't. He's a, he's a very good fighter and, and he should be picking up wins like this, especially after the second round that he had. But it felt so close, and that's what's disappointing. It, it felt like he just had to go and replicate what he did in the second against a tired and quite beaten up opponent. Um, but it didn't happen for him. Uh, what did you guys make of the the fight? And I'm going to ask you the very difficult question of where does Darren Till go? Um, I think um, I picked Drickus to win the fight. It's an interesting one, though. Um... I thought grappling, he would have the edge, and he obviously did. Um, it's hard to believe that Darren Till both lived in Brazil and trains with Hamza Jemayev and doesn't know how to stop a takedown. Um, that's, that, so that's one, that was one of my main takeaways from this fight. Um, 
from a tired Duplicy as well. Um, where you go with Till next is incredibly tough, especially you know if he's got this knee injury, like he was saying after the fight, he's obviously going to have some time off. Um, and you've got to take a big step back at this point. You're looking outside the rankings. Um, maybe it's just because he was on this card, but I was thinking Hakeem Buckley. Um, maybe that's a bit too high for Till at this stage, even. Um, I don't know. You've got to be really careful with the next move, I think. Yeah. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, yeah, Jake? Ah, uh, man, it was it was tough to watch. Like I, I, I haven't been like an, an avid Darren Till fan for a couple of years now, but even still, that was that was a tough watch. Uh, very odd first round, as you were saying. Like he was just pinned up against the cage, standing, and then he was getting hit so many times, and he would just not improve his position, but give the thumbs up to yeah. to Mark Smith, which I, again I thought was a bit of an odd decision. Um, he looked better in the in the second round though, and that was kind of the indicator to me that I had picked right. I, I went with Darren Till by decision and I thought he was on that track. I didn't think he really had a uh, duplicy in any danger of being finished, but he was landing well. And, uh, you know, there was kind of glimpses of that, that old Darren Till in there. Um, but like, as Steve said, how can you have lived in Brazil for so long and actually move in with Hamza Chemayev in Sweden and still not be able to stop a takedown? It's, it's shocking. Um, where does he go from here? If he wants to come back, and that's the that's the operative word there. If he wants to come back, you, yeah, you've got to go outside the, the top of Dean. I I think Joaquin Buckley is a little too high, honestly, yeah. um, because he's been fighting top fifteen guys in his last two fights, and he's looked oh he's looked okay in both of them. I know he got knocked out on this card, but um, he was doing okay. He looked Chris he looked good until he got knocked out. Yeah, he did. I don't. I don't think he was as good as a lot of people said he was. Like people said he was lighting Curtis up in the first round. It was like Curtis blocked yeah. a good majority of those punches. But yeah, he he looked good and he's a good fighter. Um, but I don't. I still don't like Darren's chances in that fight for whatever reason. Uh, I'd say someone like I don't know Phil Hawes, maybe. Like there, there's a guy who, like he presents a very big uh, power punching risk, but he has lost to some of the. Uh, some of the guys who are higher up. Uh, Kyle Dawkins comes to mind as well. Um, you know, a guy who's lost his last two by knockout. It's like, yeah. Who did he fight recently? Eric Anders. Yeah. Although Eric Anders used to fight light heavyweight as well, and he got till he used to fight a welterweight. So I don't know. It's it's very difficult. But if he wants to come back, that's what it is. Here's my question to you lot. Is Darren Till coming back? Well, he said he's not retiring, so um he said he wants to take time off and then see you know um so i i think he will come back just i think we'll we'll probably get another year out which is fairly standard for him at this point and i'm just taking a look through these rankings now people you could put till with it's like how low do you want to look um does go to dorovich just throwing out random names um Jordan Wright, if Darren Till fought Jordan Wright, and they said this on another podcast, um, if that if you give him Jordan Wright and he doesn't knock out Jordan Wright, no disrespect to Jordan Wright, I like Jordan Wright, but um, if he doesn't knock out Jordan Wright, then mm-hmm. then we're probably done. But um, I think you're looking fairly low for the next fight. Um, Lungambula, who yeah. just lost to Edmund, You've got... that's an option. Okay, that's 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 just unfair now. <laughs> that's 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 just unfair um yeah he would have had uh, uh dolce would have had such a, a a bad run of it if he had to fight ankalayev shabazian and till in the space of a couple of years like that's that's just hatred um jack marshman is apparently yeah, still signed I, to the ufc i don't think that that can't be right i <laughs> swear he left years ago <laughs> um no respect to Jack Marshman. Uh, but I I don't think they're gonna go as low as like uh Todorovic or, or Marshman or anyone like that. I think um I could see maybe Bruno Silva, uh GM3, someone like that. Someone who's like not top fifteen, but they're also not a complete bum. Do you know? A a, a winnable fight. GM3 don't, don't give him GM3 though. 
Mm. Yeah, but don't give him GM three because he'll he'll rock the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. GM three by third round submission always better. Nick Diaz. Oh Jesus. <laughs> that's that's sad. Sad no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, uh, I love Nick Diaz, but uh, his punches were so goddamn slow against Robbie Lawler that I, <laughs> I think Darren Till could probably beat him twice in about three minutes. Um, and that hurts me to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else uh, were you guys particularly impressed by for the rest of the finishes? Because it, it, it's nothing but finishes, so <laughs> we could go through every single one. But there was there was a lot of good stuff. Um, the Jairzinho Rosen striking Chris Dorcas, I think that went pretty much how a lot of people thought it would, I'll be honest. Um, we've seen Dorcas get knocked out a few times now, which sucks. Um, and he's talked about trying 205, so maybe that should be the option for him. Looking further down, um, Billy Q, that's the standout to me. Yeah. Um, Hernandez started well. Uh, um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Hernandez starts. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> I, mean, I think we got a slight delay on the thing. I'm not right. Um, Hernandez started well and was doing really well at his new weight class until he just wasn't. Um, and Quantio was able to turn around. Quantio is very tough, and we've seen that before, and he showed it again. Um, and a win over Alex Hernandez, who has shown a lot of promise in the past, but never quite, um, never quite lived up to what he um, shown he could do, um, is a big win for Billy Q. Um, he obviously lost his last fight to Shane Berger, so he's probably looking at just outside of the top fifteen again for his next fight. Um, uh, looking, Edmund obviously came back with a big win, um, but that's that's the bulk of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that, like like we said at the the very top, um, so many great finishes on our way to the to the final two fights, and then that kind of ended the uh, the night a little bit weirdly, especially considering it was the the last pay per view of the year for the UFC, which is always a big one. They always put on uh, a really big card for that, um, so it it just felt strange to uh, to end it like that. Um, and then we've got a fight night coming up this Saturday, which. <laughs> Again, feels weird to end the year on this. Um, it wasn't really a card I paid too much attention to and how it was being built up um, because we Is had it, the pay-per-view. It's a really fun card, actually. But it, it yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it's actually caught me off guard um, having to look at how many good fights there are on this. Again, feels weird to end the year on a, on a fight night like this. But um, as far as fight night cards go definitely not a bad one to end the year on um main event between jared cannonier and sean strickland at middleweight which uh i completely forgot this fight was even made to be honest um and it it feels a little bit of a a tough one for both guys who obviously cannonier had quite a uh quite a dominant loss to israel adesanya former champ and then sean strickland's knockout loss to alex Pereira, the current champ so Either of these guys with a win will get right back up in that middleweight title picture, but I can't help but feel like even a, even if Cannonier stops him or, or Strickland puts on a, a great dominant performance, it's going to be tough for either of these guys to get back in the title for eight many times soon. I think I think Pereira and Izzy are just going to fight for the belt at least another time. Um, do you guys think that either one of these guys could could put themselves back into the realm of a of a title shot with a big win? I think Jared could, given that purely because he hasn't fought for her before. Strickland is going to be tough, especially if Alex can beat Izzy again, because we've seen what Alex did to Strickland. Um, but I think if Jared Cannonier wins, he could be back in the mix, to be honest. Yeah, I, the big question for Sean Strickland is is how he deals with the power of Janet, J- Jared Cannonier, because there was a lot of talk in the build-up to his fight with Alex Pereira, and then he kind of just walked onto a shot that knocked him out, which you can't do against Alex Pereira. So he's going to have some questions to answer for sure. Um, and uh, Jared Cannonier as well, like didn't put on the best showing against Israel Adesanya. So 
if he's going to face Adesanya or Pereira, going to need a big statement. Um, so it's an interesting main event. I'm I'm not completely um, like excited for it, but I think it would be a good fight at least. Um, they, the the two of them have very contrasting styles, so it should be a good matchup. The co-main event, however, is the one yeah. that I think most people are going to be talking about. Uh, Armin Sarukian versus Demir Zmogulov. The, the fact that these guys aren't even top eight lightweights is terrifying. <laughs> like, this fight is going to be one of those ones where you just sit back and watch and you're just like, how? How are these guys doing this to each other? Like, they're two of the most underrated lightweights in the world, without a shadow of a doubt. Excited for that one. Yeah. I think this is this shows the depth that that division has. Like you mentioned, these guys not being top eight. But there's so many guys like that, it seems like, at this point. Um there's another great lightweight fight in this card as well. Not the same level, of course, but Drew Dober versus Bobby Green is a really fun one. Um, two guys just outside the rankings as well. Um, but yeah, Sarukian and Ismagulov, um, two great, well, two great prospects. Arman's 26, Ismagulov's 31, so he's a little bit older, but he's still shown the levels he can perform. He beat Guram in his last fight, of course. And Guram's another one, of course, who's just so, so good. Um, but yeah, this is the standout fight on this card for me. I'll always tune in to watch an Armand Sarukian fight and Damir. Um, but I would probably favour Sarukian just. It's actually some really interesting fights uh, on the prelims as well. The two that are jumping off the uh, the page to me, uh, you got Jake Matthews coming back. Uh, he put on a really uh, prof- a really impressive performance earlier this year against uh, Andre Fialio. Uh, really improved boxing, so I'm interested to see. Uh, I'm interested to see what what he does. He's going up against uh, Matthew Semelsberger, a really hard hitter and uh, a really game opponent as well. So I think that should be a good fight. Personally, I just want to see Jake Matthews win uh, because. I want to see him fight on the Perth card. And then uh, you've got uh, Julian Marquez against Deron Wynn. Uh, Julian Marquez, underrated fighter, um, a good submission artist, not the best uh, strength of schedule, but quite tough. And um, he lost his last fight to Gregory Rodriguez. There's no shame in that. And then, uh, you know, Deron Wynn, five foot six middleweight. N- need I say any more? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, in Jamie's absence, I should spotlight the two flyweight matchups on this card. But I feel like every time we get one of these fight nights lately, there's always some sneaky good flyweights on there. Um, with Amir Albazi taking on Alessandro Costa, which is highly ranked enough. But then you throw in that we've also got David Dvorak versus Manel Cape on there. Like, I don't know how they keep putting these flyweight matchups on these cards. It feels like there's always one at the moment. I'm like, how is that's that going to be a banger. Really- how yeah ridiculous but yeah like we said pretty good fight night card I, i'm excited for this event also it's on a quite good time for uk fans um i believe main cards at 12 so that's not too bad so i'm into it um we're not gonna do uh living the dream this week because we're gonna have to take a break from it i think with all of the kind of end of year stuff that we're going to be doing so that'll take a bit of a backseat whilst we do end the year awards predictions for next year um and maybe we're gonna we're gonna look at doing a fantasy draft as well which will be fun um so that'll take a bit of a, a backseat anyway and we'll pick that back up once all the end of the year obligations are uh are done and dusted anything else that you guys wanted to pick up on before we end out this episode laura sanko i have an issue with you <laughs> oh okay yeah i forgot <laughs> i yeah, don't Jake, know how we didn't mention this i don't know how yeah. we forgot this completely forgot yeah. i've wiped it from my memory already but you go for it yeah. so for the uh for the minority who may not have seen it um i don't i don't think there was a lot of people there because it did get shared on social media a lot uh, at the UFC 282 weigh-in show, Laura Sanko, very respected analyst, and I, I hope to see her on a pay-per-view someday. Um, she was giving her list of the top five active UK fighters, and there were so many things wrong with the list. Um, just you know, just to start off with, you know, where, where I had issues with it, she had Tom Aspinall on top, um, which. You know, when you've got Leon Edwards on the list, it just seems a bit pointless to put uh, Tom Aspinall on top. Um, 
Then, then she below Tom Aspinall in at number two was Conor McGregor. Now, for the uninitiated of you, Conor McGregor is from Ireland. Ireland is not in the UK. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there have been several bloody wars fought over whether or not Ireland is in the UK. And it's a bit of a touchy subject over here. Um, but, you know, some people make that mistake. She's American. She's not good at geography. That's fine. So Chris Wyman, of all people, corrected her on it and said, uh, no, Ireland's actually not in the UK. It's just Northern Ireland. And she goes, nah, it is. No, it isn't. Like Ireland, it's, a, it's, in, it's, it's, it's in the UK. So if her ignorance was not bad enough, the fact she doubled down on it for me, they're really... Um, she also really tried to claim he had Northern Irish ancestry at one point. Yeah, and then she pulls out, I was like, oh, I think his parents are from the North. Though. I don't even think that's true. Like... <laughs> Tony McGregor, his dad, has he has a, quite a strong Dublin accent, and I think his mother does as well. So I don't, yeah. Wow, that's that that one just got to me personally. I mean, the list was bad enough, but that uh, that uh, especially got at me. So Sanko, um, I know you you apologized afterwards after realizing your mistake, uh, but it, it took you long enough, might I add. But um, we will forgive you, and we will root to see you on a pay per view someday. Um, but you, yeah. That one, sorry, that's no. I'm glad you brought that up because I completely forgot. Of course, that was the most glaring issue, but she also had Paddy on the list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she had oh, Tom oh. of Paddy. <laughs> she had Paddy on the list instead of Nathaniel Wood, Mohammed Makayev, Lerone Murphy. Yeah, I can't even. All that I need to put this list because I remember, I remember being so bad. I think uh, we like all tweeted the graphic at some point. <laughs> I mean, it oh instantly got us talking about the idea of doing a, a UK MMA draft so that we could put this wrong. Uh, sorry, put her wrongs right. Um, and it, it feels bad that it was Laura Sanko of all people because. Well, you all love Laura Sanko. She's such a good analyst, but I I, I would struggle to write a, a list that had that many things you could make fun of in it. Like it in any context. It, yeah, literally. Like <laughs> if I tried to make a bad one, I, I would struggle for it to be like that. Um, like how can how can you be so involved in MMA and make a list that bad? Okay, so I I have the list here, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so at number five, we've got Paddy Pimlet, which is just a little bit disrespectful, um, as Steve said, to the likes of Lerone Murphy, Mohamed Mikhaev even. Uh, number four, you've got Arnold Allen. Yeah, sure, he deserves to be in that list. I'd put him a little bit higher, maybe. Number he's three, not, He's not number Arnold. four. No. <laughs> so at number four, you've got uh, Arnold Allen. Number three, you have the actual welterweight champion of the world, Leon Edwards. Like, no, like the actual champion of the world in his weight class, Leon Edwards, who beat the pound for pound number one just a couple of months ago. At number two, you've got Conor McGregor, who is both Irish and has been semi-retired uh, for about a year and a half. The UK zone. Uh, the, the UK zone, of course. is walking out to God Save the King with a Union Jack <laughs> in his next week. Guarantee you. And uh, at number one, you've got Tunnel, who, great fighter. Um... And I know I saw some people like, well, he's injured. He's not active. It's like, yeah, that doesn't, you know, doesn't really count. Like, he is the, he's an active fighter, but he just shouldn't be at number one. That's <laughs> that's where I have an issue with it. So, yeah. Um, as as Kyle said, uh, even if you try to make a bad list, I don't think it could be as bad as that. No. Uh, you saw the I mentioned thing, in the the, uh... the main thing she did well is not put Darren Till on the list. That was the best part of her list. Which um, both RJ Clifford and Chris Weidman had Darren Till on the list, so there's a strike for them straight away. But wow, both of them, both of those lists were at least better than Laura's <laughs> because you know, because you know there wasn't an Irishman on there, and the champion was number one. At least she hit the criteria, right? Um, well, the others did, <laughs> but um, I, I honestly, D and then DC just changed the rules completely and did most popular. That, that... There's no rules apparently. You can have yeah. you can have Irish fighters on the UK list. It's fine. No rules on the way in show. No, I honestly thought that when Jake was was doing his rant um, and brought up the wars between Ireland and the UK, that uh, my Zoom was going to cut him off like Ariel Hawani at the MMA awards. It was not looking good. 
<laughs> I thought that was going to be the end of the show. <laughs> that wasn't just a coincidence, right? Like, we know Dana put in that call. <laughs> Too much of a coincidence, that, I think. This week as well. Like, Yeah. 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 But there you go. That is it for Burble Money. I can't I can't believe we almost missed out the uh, the Laura Sanko list. Yeah, that can, is can, going... just t- can I just touch on one more thing real quick? We got the 286 announcement this week, of course. Um, yeah. March 18th in London. Um, yeah. Of course. That's, well, that's obviously a big one for us, too. But... Yeah. I mean, literally, go on any of our Twitter accounts to find out what we thought of it being in the O2. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that's all we got to say. Uh, that's it for Verbal Money. We'll catch you on the next one. Um, but hopefully we won't have to talk about people from Ireland being from the UK. There you go. <laughs>